Fabulous. Okay. Welcome everybody to the very last reading of Second Sunday Readings of 2023. I'm your host and curator, Sean Killingsworth. Welcome, uh, Jared Harrell and Megan Freshley and Sonia Greenfield. I'm so excited to have these wonderful poets with us for our final reading. These are poets that I have been following on social media for quite some time and I've been watching your publications and reading the poems. And I'm just so excited to have been able to get you guys. So um, I'm really pleased to be able to have you reading your poems live for this audience. Um, and just to get everybody warmed up, I would like to ask, um, maybe we can start with you, Jared, what have you been reading lately? Before we before we go into poems, what are you reading? Um, Sure, yeah. Nice to be here. I'm, I'm actually reading uh, The Diaspora Sonnets by Oliver de la Paz. came out uh, earlier this year. And it's wonderful the way it um, explores kind of sonnets, of course, but like also the pantoum and um, really goes to wonderful places. It's a beautifully written book, so highly recommended. Oh, nice. Yeah. Are you interested in formalist uh, poems? You know, I am here and there. I, I try them. The pantoum is, I've never written a, a good pantoum in my life, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll keep trying. But. <laughs> <laughs> they're hard. They're hard. Yeah. How about you, Megan? So right now I am reading Sister Golden Calf by Colleen Burner. Oh, interesting. It's a novella. Um, they may or may not be in the audience right now um, to hear about how much I love their novella. Oh, very cool. We have a, another author here with us very nice um and and Sonia what about you what are you what's on your nightstand I am reading um the bloody changer chamber by uh Angela Carter because I'm teaching gender and literature in the spring and this is going to be one of my assigned books so I thought maybe it would be smart to read it before I try and teach it yeah that's probably a good idea yeah yeah <laughs> that's great cover art too yeah Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and with no further ado, I think we'd like to get started. Um, so who's who's going to go first? I think, Sonia, we said we were, you were going to go first. Sure, that works so, for me. Awesome. All right. So Sonia Greenfield is the author of two recent collections of poetry entitled All Possible Histories from Riot in Your Throat and Helen of Troy is High AF from Harbor Editions. She's also the author of Let Down from White Pine Press, American Parable from Autumn House, and Boy with a Halo at the Farmer's Market from Codhill Press. Her work has appeared in the 2018 and 2010 Best American Poetry, Southern Review, Willow Springs, and elsewhere. She lives with her family in Minneapolis, where she teaches at Normandale College, edits the Rise Up Review, which is a fantastic publication, and you should all go immediately read it. Well, not immediately, but wait till this reading is over and then go read it. Uh, and she advocates for both neurodiversity and the decentering of cishet white hegemony. So everybody, please give some poetry snaps to Sonia. Sonia, sorry. No, oh, you're good. You're good. Thank you. Sometimes when I go into Starbucks, I'll just tell people that my name is Sonia because it's a lot easier than, you know, trying to, I don't know. Sometimes I even pronounce my name incorrectly. Um, sure. So I guess I'll start by reading a couple poems from Helen of Troy is High AF, um, because it uh, is the most recent book that came out. And all of the poems are from the point of view of uh, women in the Odyssey, since they don't really have much of a voice in the Odyssey. Um, so I'll go ahead and read the titled poem, Helen of Troy is High AF. And the whole collection came about when I was reading the Emily Wilson translation of the Odyssey. And this one particular line, um, which is the epigraph of this poem. Then the child of Zeus, Helen, decided she would mix the wine with drugs to take all pain and rage away, to bring forgetfulness of every evil. Book four, The Odyssey. If I knew the difference between entomology and etymology, I'd know my either. I'd know if you meant meaning or just a clacking of beetles, just a phalanx of carapace carried by a hundred legs as in centi or thousand as in milli. But my mind is modest these days. 
even modestly minded, I know it's no mistake that abduction shares a word with what penetrates me, rape. What do you know from one? Was she merely hogtied and dragged in a flaxen bag from all she ever knew? Or was she pressed face to the dirt and entered? Either way, they say rape. If you wonder what made this face, this curve of cheek, consider how candlelight catches faint down where my jaw meets this elegance of neck. You must recall my mother was force fucked by a swan. That's our fate. Our citizenship so tenuous, we are even taken by birds. You've heard how we bury our children, how we watch war made with wooden horses, how we are dragged to hell because poor Hades needs a date. As consolation, they give us poppy powder for our wine. I say, another dram of dream in mine. I am such a scholar for forgetting, such a student for letting go. I say, set the table to a swarm of servants buzzing in the corners of this opulent palace. I say, anoint the chalice to Menelaus, who lets me be as shit-faced as I please until morning wipes the prior day clean and I can try living again. Until then, I may hallucinate that a thousand launched ships never come back. Will you, my guest, drink to that? And then, <laughs> thanks for the snaps, y'all. Um, and then I'll read a poem from the perspective of Circe. There's like, you know, major and minor characters in here. So when I'm reading them out loud, I try to stick to the ones that people probably have heard of, unless you're like really into the Odyssey and you know all the characters. This is called Circe in the Age of Instagram. Nothing is anachronism if you live forever, it says in my bio. I started with carefully composed shots of the island, sun filtered through olive grove and arbor, close-ups of hermit crabs hurrying their little conches across the sand. Every influencer knows what we go through to make labor look like love. 20 takes trying to get that thirst trap, gently slopping the hogs, hair curled by afternoon heat, gorgeous in torn coveralls with my bright red bucket. Post it. How else to turn vengeance to magic and magic to commerce? Sometimes we're even the beneficiaries of serendipity, sun somehow netted behind a new sail arriving on shore, shot perfectly composed as the next set of sailors straggle into foreground. I post it. A girl must make the best of what she possesses. I share daily stories of how they squirm and tumble over each other, adorable montages of snouts snuffing the lens. I filter the ugly out of muddy trotters and mottled skin. I give them stupid names like Pegasus and Hogamemnon, then satisfy every order, belly, shoulder, bacon, and loin. Thanks, friends. Okay. So um, next I'll read a couple poems from the um my my uh from All Possible Histories, which is the book that came out, oh, I don't know, like a year ago, maybe. Um yeah, so I'll just pick a couple poems from this to read. And the first one has an epigraph too. It's by Dan Chasson. And it's the medium of poetry isn't language, really. It's loneliness, a loneliness that poets transfer to their readers. And the title um, runs into the poem. The title is I Want a Pony. Okay, so I want a pony called loneliness. 
I'll corral him in my front yard, just behind a low white fence. Children on the way to school will bring him carrots and apples, might stroke his shaggy flank, could stop to whisper in his ears, which will twitch to hear such secrets. My loneliness will tease the feral cats that slink from yard to yard, looking for new places to shit. My loneliness will nicker softly in the night when peacocks on a neighbor's roof wake us with their mating cries. My loneliness will want to be saddled and ridden through the hills above the heaving Pacific. My loneliness will not mind a heavy load. And when my loneliness gets very tired, I'll drive him to tender and endless grasses where he will graze his old gray muzzle mowing toward the west while I walk back to my truck, wiping snot from my nose with a sleeve. Then when I get home, everyone will ask where my loneliness went. I'll say he was so old that it was too hard to see him that way. And my front yard will stand empty, his trough dry, his little lawn gone to hay. Okay, and so then I'm going to jump to, um, apparently I like epigraphs. This one also has an epigraph. Um, so I was raised Catholic, but I'm not a, a, I don't practice Catholicism any longer for a whole handful of reasons. Um, so the this poem is called Prayer to St. Anthony, Patron Saint of Lost Things. When I was growing up, um, people in my town used to post uh, to St. Anthony in the Penny Saver. To, if, if they place an ad, maybe maybe St. Anthony would see it and, I don't know, help them find stuff that they've lost or something. Um, so the epigraph is, St. Anthony, who received from God the special power of restoring lost things, grant that I may find that which has been lost. Grant that I may find my mojo misplaced in middle age and replaced with progressive lenses and a penchant for Sunday crosswords. How much mojo have you restored and what does it look like? And is it usually in the couch cushions with the Apple TV remote? Tony, how many millions of earrings have you found since the beginning of Catholic time? a theoretical glimmering mountain of baubles that reaches your cloud? Is it knobby with pearls and woven through with gold wires? You must manage one hell of a spreadsheet, patron saint of relief, of signs for missing cats, of hopeless pleading for new hymens. Have you any helpers or does the nervous sweat bead unbidden on your pate? And do you wipe it with the hem of your brown robe? Do the voices clamor and clamor like cathedral bells ringing in your ears? Tony, do you cry when you can't find a boy because he already sits by your side and the boy's mother keeps you up all night with her begging, but you are powerless to return anything besides ashen flesh. Do you search in such instances for your own mojo, convinced you're better off restoring heirloom brooches and fountain pens, better at bringing a corgi back from his wandering? Would you like to switch jobs with Francis and frolic for once with the lambs instead of just sending the lost ones home? On the news, I saw you bring a body back from Nam and saw how you reunited birth mother with daughter. We're always losing, Tony. St. Anthony, who received from God the special power of restoring lost things. Where are all the socks, lighters, and wallets, the hair ties, lip balms, and iPhones? Do you keep collections to count in heaven? some calm in the careful 
numeration of unclaimed car keys. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on my time over here. So I'm going to read two more poems. And these are newer poems in that they have not yet been collected in anything yet. The first one is called Ode to the Man Who Kissed Me When I Was 13. At 13, I'd climb the rock wall and cross the grounds of Nardones to get to the little yellow deli, same yellow as my house, which was haunted by the miasma that rises from a childhood about to fall apart. How the walls on Smith Street sweated their insects, how no monumental crack showed, just the feeling that the whole place could go like the house of Usher. Was it in the parlor next door when red roses tended by my grandfather's hands were tucked into his hands that set it all in motion? Whatever the prick of misfortune, it hung about like the stink of cigarette smoke in plaster walls. Meanwhile, 13 was still roller skating and longing for sparkly laces, still glittery kittens stuck to my trapper keeper, still a long tangle of hair I never took care of. I'd climb the rock wall as often as I could if I had the quarters to carry me to the deli for starburst and a glimpse of the guy working the register. I wore a groove through the neat grass of Nardone's just to get there. How I'd stammer. Everything was gilded at 13, like it was chromed and bronzed and golden until it took a tarnish. That was the year my babysitter wrapped her car around a tree. My stepfather kicked my cat off the two-story deck and the school custodian showed me dirty magazines in his garage, as if death and sex were all part of the same lesson. Still, no wonder my obsession with unicorns, how exquisitely close I was to being one, wild-maned and magical, and a creature on the verge of being something more than merely a horse. I remember how I invited him to my birthday party and how he climbed over the wall and into my yard. But was he a man? I only know he had a thick crown of curls and was old enough to work a slicer. How must it have, how must it have looked from his side of the counter? He must have wondered at least once what it would have been like to kiss the starburst from my mouth, to tongue away all the sugar because I was pining for something I had no guile to define. He only visited the party for a minute, and then he did it. He brushed his closed lips across mine and left. I never saw him again. Thirteen was the way I could hear my own heartbeat over the strains of Pat Benatar lying awake with promises in the dark, wondering what next, what next, now that love has fled the little yellow deli on Washington Street. Praise him for running from a desire too pure to be fulfilled, desire musical as the tinkle of sleigh bells against a glass door, desire waiting for her change, silhouetted against July's sun beaming into the candy section. What man could fulfill only what 13 was asking for, but not a touch more? Okay, I'm gonna end there. Thanks folks for being here. Thank you, Sonia, that was just lovely. And I was thinking, you know, there are a lot of poems about and songs about 13. And many of them do not end feeling so good. So I really appreciate that. Um, next up to the mic is Megan Freshly. Um, so Megan, if you are ready, 
Megan is a queer poet living, well, up until very recently, living in Portland, Oregon. Now she is in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, right? Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, she's the author of the chapbook Hypnic Jerk from the Hunger Press. She's a graduate of Antioch College, the Esalen Institute, and the MFA program at Portland State University. Her poems appear in Portland Review, Witchcraft Magazine, 1001, Old Pal, so everybody, please give some poetry snaps to Megan Freshly. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Sean, for um, putting this reading together. And um, this is Rick. He really wants to be um, with you all right now. Yes. So I've got five poems for you. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. The first one is called Abandoned Wing. Living in the abandoned wing of the building you dream about most following doctor's orders meticulously and melting on the hot bulb of grief. The road falls into the ocean, the tooth falls into the cup, the snow falls pink on Neptune. May you feel beautiful each time you cross the street and may got a good night out alter the course of your life forever. Nothing is wrong with the frothing of the sea's seizure pressed wetly against great heaves of lightning that heave themselves upon the rocks, upon the guttural dark viscera. Every night's garbage night when you're with me, baby, to have and to hold the edge of the being alive in my mouth like an oyster, delicate, spacious, squish. Thank you. And this next one is about Vegas. I went to Vegas one time for like 48 hours. And, um, and this is what came out of it. Never not night. The flow of imperfection is ungovernable. This casino sky painted sky blue takes the wind out of my eyes, still glassy and pink from earlier tonight. Is it ever nighttime in heaven? Why do the painters keep painting it bright and glaring as a hospital? When finally your love possesses me completely, God holds me in his fist like King Kong. Embellishment is love, a trine of swans, other mystic debris, doing kegels in the moneyed air, doing kegels to the hold music. My grief is my hard castle, keeps me from dissolving into the plurality of thingness that way an indoor dusk can do to us. Thanks. The next one is called Trophies Unlimited, which is a sign in Portland on Burnside. Um, it's just a big, it's been there for forever. Yeah, I don't, there's no trophies inside the place. Mm -hmm. Trophies Unlimited. My face isn't available for comment at this time. My longings, they hurry me along. How good is rage? Latticing the body with laser beams, the negative space of its wake and the seams between. Lying in the sharp grass, the chest hair of the land, wanting to slide a knife into the earth. Tongue turned terry cloth from bad red wine, listening to the cymbal crashes of waves on the cliff's face, mystery squishing out between each living moment. My voice is two party balloons rubbing together. Do you ever stop identifying with your own face and then reconcile with it again at a later date? Do you ever have to feed yourself tenderly as if nursing some poor animal back to life. Um, this next one is about longing. Have any of y'all ever experienced longing? Um, woo! So this, I, I wanted to do an experiment of writing a love poem that um, wasn't about any like human, but just about a uh, imagined, um, imagined somebody. Uh, it's called Reliquary. I'm wearing twigs in my hair from falling through your canopy all night, unable to catch hold of even a single branch. I don't need to know you belong to me. I just need to know I belong to you. You dipped me in starry oil. You slipped me on like an evening glove, the dusk full of dark murmurations. These big ellipses strung around you like an enormous rosary. Your face is so beautiful that I shut up. My brain is tufted with you, buttons I never want to unbutton. I listen for you at my door like a dog, 
I move around my house pointlessly. I go to the gym trying to wear out my longing. There are a million ways to love, each as specific as a freckle, as specific as the tracers of absinthe light the fireflies leave behind tonight. The saint stands alone and so must the cheese. Your long stare paints an alligator moat around you. I wrench myself to life again, like a late budding winter rosebush. I cut a long stem and hold it to my breastbone in the shallow moat. My hands under the water, unfamiliar to me as starfish. Imagining the net of your breath bending like a grid around me. Chase me through the room like a nymph in a clear scarf. Kiss me like Saturn devouring his sun. You're still right here with me like a shining scar, like those two pond dredged statues leaning forehead to forehead in the undercroft. Thank you. I'm just snapping for undercrofts. What a word. Okay, this is the last one. It's called New Plague Outfit. We're approaching the light at the end of the tunnel of love. Our swan boat lists in the silver water. If you leave at dawn, please wake me first. Do you know what's such a good feeling? Please circle back if you find out. A Venus flytrap in her miniature protest sign. Don't poke me, it uses all my energy to snap shut. For you, I have exact change. I've waited a very long time to wait an even longer time. In Antarctica flows a hot menstrual rivulet down into the deepest structures of earth. They wait and wait for absolutely whatever. For them, it is such a good and the only feeling. Thanks guys. Okay, I found my mute button this time. Thank you so much, Megan. I really appreciate it. Your poems were wonderful. Um, uh, I don't want this to end. Can we just rewind and go back to the beginning and do everything all over again, you guys? Would that be okay? <laughs> just kidding. Um, but we do have one more poet before this afternoon is going to end, fortunately. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce you all to Jared Harrell. Jared is the author of Let Our Bodies Change the Subject, which won the 2022 Roz Shoemaker Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry uh, from University of Nebraska Press and um, Go Because I Love You from Diode Editions. He's been awarded the Stanley Kunitz Memorial Prize from American Poetry Review, as well as the William Matthews Poetry Prize from Asheville Poetry Review. Harrell's poems have recently appeared in journals such as 32 Poems, Beloit Poetry Journal, Electric Literature, Plowshares, Poem A Day, The Southern Review, and The Sun. Um, he teaches writing, plays drums, and lives in Westchester, New York with his family. Please, everybody, give some poetry snaps for Jared. Oh, something weird just happened on my screen. Thanks. All right, I Thanks can mute so much, myself. <laughs> um, great to be here. Great. Uh, hearing Sonia and Megan's poems. Uh, I'm happy to be in this um, Zoom community with y'all. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, some poems from my collection, Let Our Bodies Change the Subject, which came out a couple months ago from University of Nebraska Press. Um, it's it's a book that's kind of knee deep in parenthood and love and loss and this idea of like living for joy, but also feeling like it's all going to hell um, and how to negotiate those two feelings and how to raise children in, in a world like that. Um, I'm gonna read eight poems from the collection. I like letting people know how many poems I'm gonna read that way. If you're not liking them, you can mentally count how many are left. Um, so I'll start with the opening poem. Um, so I have two kids, uh, a daughter who's 10, a son who's eight, and they show up a lot in my poems to their tremendous delight. Uh, this, this first poem, um, takes place kind of in and around New York City, um, goes to Queen Zoo, it goes to Coney Island and, and everywhere in between. It's called Sad Roller Coaster. My daughter is in the kitchen working out death. She wants to get it, how it tastes and feels. Her teacher talks like it's some glittery gold sticker. Her classmates hear rumors, launch it as a curse when toys aren't shared. Between bites of cantaloupe, she considers what she knows. Her friend's grandpa lives only in her iPad. Dr. Seuss passed, but keeps speaking in rhyme. 
We go to Queen Zoo and spot the beakish skull of a white-tailed deer tucked between rocks in the puma's enclosure. It's just for show, I explain, explaining nothing. That night and the one after, my daughter dreams of bones, how they lift out of her skin and try on her dresses. So silly, she laughs when I ask if she's okay. Then, toward the back end of summer, we head to Coney Island to catch a Cyclones game. We buy popcorn and fries and pop fly arcs over checkerboard grass. When past the warning track, the park wall, she sees a giant wooden spine. This brownish red maze traced in decay. She calls it sad roller coaster, then begs to be taken home. Um, this next one features uh, both my kids, uh, and it has a tiny little bit of singing in it, for which I apologize in advance. Uh, it's called All I've Ever Wanted. The almond milk has turned. Flecks of foul snow slink in slow liquid. Not the discovery I had angled for this morning, but as my dad likes to sing like some Jewish Mick Jagger, you can't always get what you want which is just what I crooned to my two children, driving them up the wall, because of course, all they want is to get what they want. A fifth scoop of gelato to play Minecraft till their eyeballs pixelate in their skulls. What humbling work to haul kids toward thoughtful, the kind and humankind like a foreign language on a stubborn tongue. Yet even as a toddler, my son would refuse a lollipop if his sister didn't get one, still plucks an extra sticker to gift her after school. And hell, my daughter can't ride an elevator without making a new friend or some lady's day by praising her earrings, her sweater, or purse. My point about discovery has escaped me by now, though I know the old chorus for thwarted desire. My cereal will be dry, coffee, taken black. I will try against hope to be better than myself, which is all I've ever wanted and everything I need. Thank you. Um, this next one's a pretty short poem. Um, and I wrote it in all in one sitting and didn't edit it, which is very unusual for me. I tend to revise a lot. Um, but this is a poem about trying to be present in one's own life. And it's kind of a, a strange poem to be reading at the end of, of such a brutal month, um, but it's called The Sweet Spot. On better days, I can tell this is it. We are well inside it. That misfortune implies a fortune to lose. I can see despite it all, we have hit our sweet spot. The best it's gonna get. And yet, Someone out there dreams she's a hummingbird and is fighting like hell not to wake up. Thank you. Uh, so one thing about having kids for me was um, it sort of gave me a new lens through which to see my own childhood and to uh, see my own parents as people who were young and trying their best and winging it. Uh, so they do show up in, in this collection as well, here and there. Um, this first poem, I'll read one uh, which features my father, and then I'll, feature, I'll read one which features my mom. So this first one uh, refers to the Jewish practice of daily prayers called tefillin. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It has these black straps in this box with verses from the Torah in it. Um, and one day, and he he, my father isn't a religious person, but he would put these on every morning before going off uh, and being a mechanic at work. And so, um, and then when I, I went for, went to college and left the house and then came home one day years later with my kids and saw him with Tefillin on, I'd forgotten he did it. And so the poem kind of arises from that, from that forgetting. Tefillin. You think you know your life till you forget your own father prays every morning unzips a velvet pouch to wrap worn leather strips about his left arm and hand seven times around like dressing a wound. 
You forget he prays in greased blue coveralls before the workday rush of mufflers and brake pads and that he prays on Sundays in sweatpants and socks. He sets a black box a centimeter above his hairline, slaps a yarmulke upon his skull, prays, then stops. You think you know your life, but forget your father has done this since you were six, since a thin, kindly rabbi spent a week in your home. How could you forget? It's true your life no longer confides in you. For too long you've been wary, screening its calls like a bookie you have lost all resources to repay. You forget your father prays the way he does paperwork, all alone and without enough light. He never makes a show of it, never once offered to teach you how. You think you know your life until the power sparks out one snowy December morning. So you climb your parents' stairs with your two children and laundry in tow, and there's a stranger by the curtains. His eyes squeezed shut, toes arrowed toward Jerusalem, bound in black lines. Thank you. Uh, so this next one's for my mom. Um, uh, I, some of you might have uh, seen that 2009 movie called Adventureland about the amusement park. Um, and it's based on a real adventure land uh, that was in uh, Long Island, New York, right around where I grew up. And that's uh, where this poem takes place. Behind the Painted Guardrail. My mom and I take my son to Adventureland to ride every conceivable vehicle in identical slow circles. We watch as the fire truck keeps pace with a rocket ship, an old buggy with the Formula One racer. The park is pretty dead, so she lets him stay on. This teenage employee with a bright red visor and a look so vacant, it quiets the soul. As a kid, I once proclaimed, when I get older, I want to work at Adventureland, to which my mother swiftly replied, when you get older, you want to own Adventureland. Turns out I did neither, but that exchange persists in the annals of family history as a testament to ambition and a healthy entrepreneurial spirit. In truth, my mother knew little about me, but loved both the me I was and wasn't, a devotion so bright, I vanished in its glow. My son knows only left turns. He spins and keeps spinning in his blue police cruiser before seizing a bulldozer six feet away. My mom and I wave from behind the painted guardrail as he sways back and forth, steering and honking like he owns the place. The teenager yawns, flips a rusty switch, I want to tell my mother more than I can say. Um, I'll read, uh, so I guess I'll read three more. Um, this next one features uh, my brother who um, once thought it would be a great idea to play full court basketball and low top converse. Uh, with a bunch of college students and he injured his Achilles. Um, and so I wound up uh, spending a bunch of time watching movies with him while he was recovering from surgery. And uh, in the process of that injury, I also wound up looking up the Achilles myth. Uh, and so that works its way into the poem as well. Uh, it's called Achilles. My brother came down with a defensive rebound and a body prized and trained against time much like Achilles believed he was invincible until Paris's arrow torpedoed his heel. Who plunges into battle without proper footwear? Nearly 40, my brother wore low tops, heard the hard pop of tendon as he fell. Here on the sofa, his left leg elevated beside prescription painkillers and a bottle of blue Gatorade, I strain to stay casual, keep things upbeat. I say, did you hear there's one blockbuster left in America? Or Achilles actually died of his wound. So by most accounts, you're doing really well. When that fails to take, I challenge my brother in NBA 2K. We orchestrate fadeaways, no look alley-oops, pixels so intuitive it feels almost true. 
But the truth is, I don't know what to do for him. When his best friend, Patroclus, was killed in battle, Achilles came out of retirement to avenge his death, slaughtered Hector, then dragged his corpse across Troy. I buy my brother crosswords and sour gummy worms, sit through whatever movie he wants to see, as we nurse an ache, both sudden and ancient, these bodies that hold us, this watching them go. Thanks so much. I'm gonna read uh, two more. Um, so during COVID, my in-laws sold their house and one thing that didn't make the move was their Encyclopedia Britannica set. And so I found it uh, in their recycling bin and that struck me as kind of sad. So I wrote an elegy for them. This is called Elegy for Recycled Encyclopedias. In the end, every detail in the world couldn't save you. Not a thorough summation of medieval plumbing systems, nor the range and migration patterns of a Eurasian bullfinch. Not Bach, cuckoo clocks, or even Piaget's theory of object permanence did the trick. Amid the dim, dusty heft of entry after entry, each smoke-stained century, treaty, and canal, there was the hard data of your being redundant, a poor use of space. So after decades insisting you hold post between a lazy boy and an upright piano, we split the tight ranks of your regiment, your navy and maroon uniforms with gold foil trim. No, you weren't shocked. You knew all too well the way of phonographs and monocles, giant ground sloths and floppy disks. Grime grew from your uncracked spines, save nostalgia, or the occasional Wi-Fi hitch. It's a miracle that we are, till the instant we aren't. You knew that too, a knowledge as mythic and dispensable as fact. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll, I'll, I'll read just one more. Um, I know we're in the middle of fall, but this is a spring poem. Uh, it's a poem, I think it's a poem about loving the world even when, maybe especially when, the world is a really hard place to love. Uh, it's called Spring Crush. It also features my daughter again. It's early spring on our walk home from school when my daughter tells me she's in love with the world. Last week it was a boy with small serious eyes and a glorious bowl cut, but it seems she's moved on, falling for the world as she twirls in its sunlight and our shadows douse the concrete below. Should I aim to dissuade her? Must I explain this world will leave her for dust, leave her with the taste of rust on her tongue? But she smiles and slips fingers through mine, a sweetness not yet teased from her grip. Even those teens who pack the sidewalk with trendy sneakers and covert insecurities stop slapboxing, pause to let us pass. Nearly home, we spot blossoms burning indigo and pink, a whirl of two squirrels scrape up a tree. Better to take things slowly, I'd say, but the girl splits off and sprints the final block. Sunstruck, smitten, a whip of perfect limbs, stretched to broken sky. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. A whirl of squirrels, loved it. <laughs> Jared, Sonia, Megan, what a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, all three of you for joining Second Sunday Readings. Thank you for being here for the last reading of the year. I feel like this was a really special one. This has been a great afternoon for me. I think it's been a really great afternoon for Glenn. Um, I've been watching your face this whole afternoon. It's been really, Glenn, you could see everything he's thinking right on his face. And so I can, I know that, it, you know, a lot of these poems just, they, they ring so many chords in us. So we're very grateful. Um, okay, so today is November 12th. Um, we've got a couple weeks till Thanksgiving. I'd like to express my gratitude to poets and poetry and to the Second Sunday audience. Um, it's been a fabulous, wonderful, enriching, positive year. Um, you can check out all of the videos of these 
recordings online. We have a YouTube channel. So if you just go on YouTube and look up Second Sunday Readings, um, we are there. This recording will be there in probably a week or two, uh, depending on how uh, quickly we're able to get that edited down, making sure Glenn will take care of all of my ums and uhs so that I sound professional and erudite. Um, that's one he's got to get rid of. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also we have a podcast too, wherever you get your, your podcast, you can listen to previous episodes too. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so pod, if you are driving in the car, if you're moving cross country, if you're unpacking your boxes, if you are traveling, uh, definitely check out the podcast. It's a really nice way to get your poetry, your, your daily recommended allowance of poetry. So um, thanks to everybody here. Um, catch us online and uh, we'll hopefully see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Sean.